All right, we'll get started now. Um, thank you all for coming to the Distinguished Faculty Lectureship in Infectious Diseases. I'll briefly introduce the lectureship, and then um, I'll bring Dr. Crone up uh, for the introduction of Dr. Hotez, who will then be giving us the seminar. Um, so we've had a series of lectureships over the years since 2009. Um, pretty much uh, all of the speakers so far have been bacteriologists and have been focused on bacterial pathogenesis or, and or host response. Uh, Dr. Hotez will break the mold because, um, first of all, he works primarily on parasitic infections and because he does a lot more than that, and you'll be hearing about some of that later on. Um, I would like to briefly acknowledge all of the groups that collaborate to uh, fund this lectureship and supply the, uh, uh, the, the, the material costs and the audiences for these lectureships. Um, we have the uh, MSTP program here, directed by Joe Barberi, uh, Adult and Pediatric Infectious Diseases Divisions, uh, the Center for Infectious Disease Research, the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, and also the Office of Global Health. So at this point, um, I'd like to thank all of those uh, parties for supporting this lectureship all over the years. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Crone to introduce Dr. Hotez. Oh, hello, everybody. This is a particular pleasure for me as someone who's been interested in tropical medicine, parasitology, his whole career. Um, all these things are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the amazing uh, record of Dr. Hotez. Um, I thought I would just add a couple more tidbits um, about him. He is truly one of the brightest stars in the entire world right now of tropical medicine and parasitology, both uh, within the United States and globally. A, a strong advocate for uh, addressing diseases of poverty, the, the great neglected tropical diseases of the world. So, uh, received almost every award, I think, in the world there is to, to get. Uh, and he was the president of the American Society of Tropical Medicine, 2010, 2011. And the website, the homepage for TropMed, still has his entire presidential address for free. You can download it if you like, um, which very succinctly um, describes a lot of um, his background. Other things to know, he's the founding editor-in-chief of PLOS ne Neglected Tropical Diseases. He co-founded the Global Network for uh, Neglected Tropical Diseases. He seems to be on television and interviewed more than Tony Fauci these days, it seems like, <laughs> possibly. Um, everywhere you look in every uh, newsprint or radio or television um, station. Um, he's introduced into political conversations around the world, especially in the G20, the concept of blue marble health to raise awareness of neglected diseases and the impact on, um, on the extreme poor living in the wealthiest countries of the world. Uh, including the United States. One of the highest honors that the State Department can uh, bestow upon a scientist is to name them a science envoy for a big chunk of the world. And Dr. Hotez was named a science envoy for all of Africa and the Middle East in 2014. And also, very importantly, he really launched and popularized the concept known as vaccine diplomacy around the world, you know, illustrating the shared and urgent needs of the United States as well as uh, other countries around the world. This is taken right from the, uh, the uh, Sabin Vaccine Institute webpage. Uh, Dr. Hotez is the president of the Sabin Vaccine Institute and, uh, as you can see, has done a tremendous amount about expanding the portfolio of, of activities, uh, innovative approaches, uh, achieving consensus and training programs, global coordination, global collaborations in vaccine development, and very importantly, shaping health policy through his activities such as being a, a science envoy um, and many other things. One of the many amazing things he's done through the Sabian Vaccine Institute is to expand the number of, of vaccines which the Institute is supporting and developing. So certainly the traditional childhood vaccines, but has introduced um, uh, 
anti-Helminth vaccines. So I, feel, I, I still think the only hookworm vaccine uh, clinical program that's going on in the world right now, uh, but has, uh, that was the first, but adding schistosomiasis vaccines, leishmania, Chagas disease, a SARS vaccine, and possibly a malaria. Are you part of the malaria vaccine? Not so much malaria. Not so much, but, but I mean, and if that all is not amazing enough, one of the other very amazing things about him is that in spite of all the, uh, the, the high level he operates in, he's not lost his sense of humor. So I got permission to use this. This is one of the publicity photos that Baylor used when he was named Dean. And uh, I think if you're going to be spending any amount of time in Washington, it's going to be very helpful to keep your sense of humor. So uh, with that, uh, I give you Dr. Hotez. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, can people hear me? I don't know if I'm mic'd or... Okay. Can people hear me okay? Yeah, good, thanks. Uh, I'm going to not stand behind the podium because I've learned over the years that someone of my stature, when I stand behind the podium, all you see is podium. So I'm going to try to start in front. I'm trying to make this a little more of a, if I can, a discussion and, and make it as interactive as I can. So thank you, Dr. Crone, Dr. Barberi, for... And, uh, Jennifer for inviting me uh, here for my first trip to Milwaukee. I stayed in the Pfister Hotel, which was gorgeous, really, really beautiful. So I really appreciated that and putting me up in such elegant uh, surroundings. Well, so what I want to do uh, is uh, this afternoon, I guess now it is, to give you kind of a broad overview of where I think uh, the world of infectious diseases is heading. Uh, which includes many aspects of global health, but not exclusively. We'll be talking about some aspects uh, happening uh, in the United States. And, uh, and, if, and don't hesitate to interrupt me and ask questions, because I prefer to make this as uh, interactive uh, as possible. I'm going to start here, which has been our global framework for talking about infectious diseases for the last 15 years. Uh, and uh, we've now transitioned from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. How many people have heard of the Millennium Development Goals? So a few, a few, not that many. So this is probably the overarching framework that has launched the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief to put people on antiretroviral drugs across Africa. It's the framework that launched Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, all the big picture global health programs. And it's what got a lot of young people charged up about global health. You got Brad Pitt doing a four-part series on the Millennium Development Goals for PBS. And at that time, if you got Brad, you also got Angie, not so much now, but, um, but back then you did. And you got Bono involved and, Brad, and uh, George Clooney. So this created a real buzz when we talked about uh, global health. And what was important about it with respect to infectious diseases is there were two goals that were specifically focused around infection. The idea that infectious diseases were related to development. We have plenty of room down the front there if you, if you want. We have the, the idea that the two, that infectious diseases both occurred in the setting of poverty and they helped promote poverty. And this was uh, Millennium Development Goal number four to reduce child mortality, represented by the teddy bear, and number six to combat AIDS. Uh, malaria and other diseases. And this produced a lot of uh, excitement and activity, which is being carried on now that the, the Millennium Development Goals ended at the end of 2015, has now gone on to the Sustainable Development Goals, which we can also uh, talk about. So uh, I thought maybe a little bit of time talking about what the impact has been. So the first part of this talk is really looking at what's been successful, what's worked. So let's look at this Millennium Development Goal related to child uh, mortality. Uh, and this is um, uh, what, what, what was launched, what, which helped launch uh, PEPFAR, the President's uh, Emergency Plan for, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is this, the Reduced Global Mortality, is what, what launched the Gavi Alliance, the Global Alliance uh, for Vaccines and Immunization. And the idea was, to look at um, what would happen in order as an effort to reduce child mortality, uh, what, what we could do to um, expand the use of existing vaccines uh, for uh, uh, childhood illnesses, for measles, mumps, uh, uh, rubella, for diphtheria, pertussis, 
uh, tetanus uh, for hepatitis B, Haemophilus influenza type B, and then introduce new vaccines for pneumococcal disease and rotavirus disease. And that, so that was the basis for uh, this Millennium Development Goal number four, very much around vaccines. And um, we're now in a position to evaluate it because what happened was, uh, in addition to launching the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, it's what Bill Gates also launched uh, this initiative to measure the impact, and it's called the Global Burden of Disease Study. And it's a massive undertaking uh, based in Seattle, Washington, but involves hundreds of investigators around the world. And this is, and they're coming out in a series of these capstone papers in The Lancet and the others. And this is what the author list looks like. It looks like a paper coming out of the CERN Physics Laboratory. Massive undertaking. I'm actually here somewhere. It's like, where's Waldo? You know, there, uh, th there I am. So, um, so the question, and this is very important because if, because now, so much of these big initiatives like Avi and the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief is dependent on uh, congressional appropriations. The U.S. government is still the biggest uh, funder. So, what was the impact? So, here's the punchline. The punchline is, wow, look at look at the impact. Um, uh, through the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, we've seen now an 80% reduction in measles, tetanus, deaths, pertussis, diphtheria, haemophilus influenza type B, pneumococcal disease, rotavirus, two and a half million ch childhood lives every, saved every year to the point where the number of kids dying every year has gone from around 12 million to around 4 million. So a huge uh, impact, a hands down success. Now, there's kind of a now, the success has not been even across the world. There's been pockets of uh, areas of the world where we've not been successful, either because of conflict or other things. And probably the least successful uh, large country has been, anybody want to guess? The United States. So we actually lost ground. We've actually been reversing Millennium Development Goal number four because of a very aggressive uh, anti-vaccine movement that initially uh, began in, in California because parents uh, at that time were allowed to opt their kids out of getting uh, vaccinated. Uh, they, had, they allowed non-medical exemptions in the state of California. And this resulted then in large measles outbreaks uh, over the last decade or so, including most recently in uh, in. Uh, or Orange County around Disneyland or Marin County. Uh, there was also, any, do we have any measles virologists here? Uh, so we, we also had cases associated with called, what's called SSPE, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, a terrible chronic, uh, serious neurologic complication leading to uh, coma and death. And so this was quite tragic. Now the California legislature did step up and uh, they closed that loophole, so now California is one of the highest measles cover vaccine coverage rates uh, uh, in the country, so that was great. But what happened was, uh, as that happened, uh, everybody, um, so we saw this big rising tide of the anti-vaccine uh, movement uh, in, in, the, in, in California, and this is what then caused these measles outbreak. This is the spread of anti-vaccine uh, sentiment uh, in, in California. So what happened? What happened was once they closed the loophole and solved the problem in California, everybody moved to Texas. And so then where I work now, so Texas became the center of the anti-vaccine movement. And it had multiple pieces to it, uh, including uh, this guy, uh, Andrew Wakefield, who um, wrote a paper in The Lancet in the 90s claiming measles, mumps, rubella, but rubella vaccine was the cause of uh, autism and came up with this very bizarre mechanism involving the GI tract. That paper was retracted by the Lancet because it wasn't reproducible and also there's evidence he had conflicts of interest. So he of course moves to Austin, Texas, uh, where he's now directed this very slick documentary called Vaxxed. Anybody ever have seen the movie? Uh, and uh, so what'd you think? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's a very slick Hollywood style production and uh, it tells the story of how these parents of kids with autism you know, are suffering and claims this vast conspiracy um, 
uh, vast conspiracy by the Centers for Disease Control that they're sitting on all this information showing vaccine cause autism. It's, it's a very compelling story, except that it's all bullshit, right? That it's all completely, <laughs> it's all totally, totally uh, made, made up. Um, but that didn't stop them from starting this organization called Texans for Vaccine uh, Choice. Um, did we get the internet here by any chance? What? Because I could show you something really fun. Uh, let's just see if we get the internet. If, if not, it's not a big deal, but uh, let's see. That oh, looks like we do. So Texans for Vaccine Choice. Yeah, here it is. So here's their website. So here's their website, Texans for Vaccine Choice. It's a political action committee, very powerful in Texas. Here's their website. Here's, here's what God looks like over here. Here's a, here's a picture of God. Um, here, here's the baby, and here are the Texas colors over here. And then what you could do is click exemptions, and you can fill out request form and exempt your child out of getting vaccinated. Um, and it's, it's very, very, they've made it very easy uh, 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 to do that. So um, the, what we have now in Texas is uh, these are what the numbers look like. Uh, we have now we're up to 50,000 kids in the state of Texas who are not getting vaccinated. Uh, and it's not evenly spread. It's very much over the Austin area uh, in part because that's where Wakefield and Texans for Vaccine Choices also, Denton, Texas, for some reason. And so I've written a piece for Public Library of Science saying Texas is going to have a, start having measles outbreaks. It's, it's inevitable. And why do I pick measles? Anybody want to tell me why I pick measles of all the different vaccine preventable diseases? It's highly contagious, and there's a lot of it in other countries. It's highly <laughs> contagious, and there's a lot of it in other countries, exactly. And, and it has a very high R naught value, high reproduct, high R zero number, a reproductive value of 12 to 18. So measles tends to be the canary in the coal mine of when vaccine rates go down. That's often the first uh, breakthrough uh, thing that you see. So why am I so uh, outspoken about this? I've written about this in the New York Times. And, and so the other hat I wear in addition to developing vaccines is I'm also a parent of four kids, uh, including my youngest daughter, Rachel, who uh, has autism and other mental disabilities. And I point out not only as there massive evidence, and you can actually go to our web, National School of Tropical Medicine website, where we provide all the papers to show there's no link between vaccines and autism. I take it a step further and say there's no plausibility because now for all the new information we're learning about autism, like this paper by Eric Korchesny's group from UCSD, that the changes in the brain of kids with autism are happening in the first trimester of pregnancy, well before uh, they ever see vaccines. So there's not even any uh, plausibility. So that's one of the, the next big challenges. Now the anti-vaxxers, as they're called, have scheduled a march on Washington for this Friday. So RFK Jr., Bobby Kennedy has scheduled this big march. And so this thing's not going away. And I'm very worried now about the spreading uh, internationally as well, because we export our culture, right? We export Hollywood movies. We export uh, rock stars. We're now going to export this anti-vaccine sentiment. And you can, it's already starting to happen in places like China, uh, Russia, uh, uh, Nigeria, Brazil. India, these are big places, so I'm worried we could, we could actually ignite the reversal of Millennium Development Goal number four. So, any questions about MDG4? Yes? I was just wondering why you thought facts would make a difference to people's opinion. Why, why, <laughs> why the movie? Why, why the movie would? by the facts, the actual facts that you just Oh, said. yeah, well, exactly. But I think you have to start somewhere. And, you know, one of the problems is we don't get any backing by the U.S. government, right? The Health and Human Services Secretary says nothing. CDC Director says nothing. Surgeon General, anybody know who the Surgeon General is? Says nothing. Um, the head of the NIH says nothing. So that, that's the problem. And the truth is, it's not just in the Trump administration. It was true in the Obama administration. It was true in the Bush administration before that, and even going back to the Clinton administration, this sort of silence. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's part of the problem as well. But you know, anything we can do, I, I'm, otherwise I'm worried we're going to start. It's, the only thing that's going to close, start closing loopholes are measles outbreaks. Yes? So you've obviously thought about this for a while. 
Do you think there's anything behind that movement besides ignorance, or is there something else hidden that we're... Well, it varies. So, so the anti-vaxxer movement comes in different flavors, different colors. So for instance, in California, it was, I don't know how quite how to, you described it very well the other night. It was sort of, sort of a peace, love, granola kind of crunchy movement. You know, we have to be very careful what we give our kids, right? right? In Texas, there's pieces of that, but there's also sort of like an, almost like an alt-right tea party flavor to it that, you know, you, you can't take our guns away and you can't tell us what to do with our kids uh, either. So I think those, those things are underlined. And they're trying, and Wakefield now is very clever. You know, he's adaptable. He's now trying to couch this as a civil liberties issue, uh, which plays very well in Texas, but to which I then counter it by saying, okay, well, what about the civil liberties now of a young mother or parent who's terrified of bringing about her infant baby uh, into uh, Walmart or uh, in a public library because they're worried the baby's going to get measles because the baby's not old enough to get the measles vaccine. But So the, the, the story continues. The, the, the anti-vaxxers in Texas are also having now a big event on August, on April 13th in the Capitol. So it's going to be very interesting. OK, let's go on to this other uh, very important infectious disease, Millennium Development Goal, to combat AIDS, malaria, and uh, other diseases. And this is what's launched the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Um, anybody know what that's funded to now by the US government, since you're paying for it? Or your parents are paying for it? It's $8 billion. So the whole US global health budget until it gets slashed in this current administration, is $10 billion a year, of which $8 billion is devoted to putting people on antiretroviral drugs. So now we've been able to evaluate that as well. Uh, this is now half the author list. But I couldn't read the whole author list. So let's see, Waldo is, uh, here I am, uh, goes alphabetically. Um, so. And that one has also made a big difference. Not as dramatic, because we don't have vaccines, but 19 million lives saved from AIDS, 30% reduction uh, in malaria, uh, making a big difference. Now, where I really got involved in this one was uh, uh, the third part that, nobody, that everybody forgot about. So the, the goal is called combat AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. And believe it or not, Brad and Angie didn't get too excited about something called other diseases, and they didn't provide a lot of advocacy about other diseases, and neither did George Clooney or Bono. So uh, those of us who worked on other diseases found ourselves on the outside looking in on all this uh, tremendous excitement. So one of the things we did was we undertook a branding exercise and grouped uh, a, a group of 13 or 14 tropical infections that are high, highly prevalent among the poor, there are ancient afflictions, disabling, stigmatizing, and poverty promoting. I'll show you the list in a minute. There are diseases like hookworm and schistosomiasis and leishmaniasis. And we did a branding exercise and just started calling them as a group the neglected tropical uh, diseases. And, um, and we didn't have any of the celebrity community at the time, so I just started going out there. And I wrote this book for popular consumption, which my kids would call Dad's Forgotten Book on Forgotten People <laughs> with Forgotten Diseases. But it ultimately went into its second edition, and uh, now you've got just translated into Japanese, so it's getting a little less uh, forgotten. So here's the list. Uh, so I like to call these the most important diseases you've never heard of. This is the list of neglected tropical diseases. A lot of them are wormy diseases, ascariasis, trichuriasis, hookworm disease, schistosomiasis. Not many people realize it. Intestinal worm infections, ascariasis, maybe the most common affliction of people living in poverty. Here's dengue, foodborne trematode infections, lymphatic filariasis, river blindness, Chagas disease, leishmaniasis, trachoma, and, and the list goes on. And now they've added Zika and Ebola uh, to the list. So here's a, a, a good example of why we need to be concerned about these diseases. Many of them are not killer diseases, but they're chronically disabling, like lymphatic filariasis, elephantiasis. Uh, affects 40 million people in the world, and people are too sick to go to work. So this person can't uh, be a subsistence farmer to, to pay for his family. So he says, it's quite a problem for me when I have to stand at work for long periods of time. Uh, another really important one uh, is schistosomiasis. 
it may be one of, the most, one of the most common gynecologic conditions of girls and women living in poverty in Africa because not many people realize it, but what we used to learn about in medical school or graduate school is urinary tract schistosomiasis. That's because nobody bothered doing a colposcopic exam on the girls and women with this condition. Half of them have what's called female genital schistosomiasis, and it's associated with now a three to four-fold increase in HIV AIDS. So this may be the most important, Africa's most important cofactor in its AIDS epidemic uh, that you've never heard of. So what do we do about this? Well, uh, in the early 2000s, after the launch of the Millennium Development Goals, we strategically, and I say we, myself, David Molyneux at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, and Alan Fennick at Imperial College London with Lorenzo Savioli at World Health Organization, sketched out this map and noticed that a lot of neglected tropical diseases, uh, including these top seven here, ascariasis, trichuriasis, hookworm, schistosomiasis, lymphatic filariasis, onchocerciasis, trachoma, and foodborne trematode infections uh, were over geographically overlapping. And we wrote these series of papers in the Public Library of Science about the concept of bringing these diseases together with a package of medicines where each of the medicines was donated by the major pharmaceutical company. So an example would be uh, Zithromax. How many people take Zithromax or z in the last year? Anybody not take Zithromax or z in the last year? So you <laughs> took it for your strep throat, you took it for your otitis media, uh, your bronchitis, and Pfizer makes a gazillion dollars for it, but it can also be, re be repurposed for once a year for treating trachoma. So the idea is this package of medicine be given once a year for 50 cents a person per year. And we wrote these as a series of back-to-back -back papers. And, and at that time, PLUS NTDs didn't exist. It was PLUS medicine. But then what do you do? Because we didn't have anybody doing the advocacy. And at this time, I was chair of microbiology at George Washington University, which is right next to the White House. And would just start doing it on our own. We would go down to the White House executive office buildings, congressional office buildings, and start telling people about this opportunity and not trying not to get arrested also when, when, when I did that. And it worked. So, and we got uh, two US presidents involved. And it really goes to show you how, uh, the, is, I guess the message, for, especially for young people, is don't underestimate the power of your voice as a scientist. Uh, you have a very powerful voice if you choose to uh, exercise it. So uh, the International Business Times wrote this, how the three of us, myself, David Mull, and you, Alan Fennick, they used to call us the three musketeers, market in neglected tropical diseases and raise more than a billion dollars. And, and now through you at the USAID program, we've got more than 450 million people uh, on these treatments. That's provided now the, the new president uh, doesn't, doesn't cut us uh, significantly. So this is the impact now. This is the results of that, uh, of that program now that's been going on 10 years. And what we've now achieved is a 50% reduction in global prevalence of lymphatic filariasis, river blindness, trachoma, ascariasis. And there's other elimination efforts going on for sleeping sickness and rabies. So we're at the point now where we can talk about eliminating, as a public health problem, five or six uh, different neglected tropical diseases. That's the good news. The bad news is we've also seen reversal on about nine of those diseases. So we've seen a big rise. So for schistosomiasis, hookworm, and whipworm are not doing so well. And uh, for things like leishmaniasis, Chagas disease, dengue, uh, Ebola, of course, we're really losing the battle. And so, the, I mean, there's, there's exceptions, of course, but the, the bottom line is we're making great progress on uh, AIDS and malaria and some neglected tropical diseases, but we're really losing the battle on some of these vector-borne neglected diseases transmitted by arthropods or snails or certain zoonotic diseases. So the, the, as we're moving into the Millennium Development Goals, what we're seeing is this. Uh, I call it global health whack-a-mole. We've, we've knocked down uh, AIDS, and now Somebody yelled at me when I presented this about TB that I, was, I completely got TB wrong. And I think they're right, so I got to remove TB. We really haven't made that much progress on tuberculosis, malaria, some neglected tropical diseases. But now under the new sustainable development goals, we've got to focus on vector-borne neglected diseases and zoonotic diseases. Let me give you a couple of examples. So um, what's happening in the Western Hemisphere now? We've seen now dengue all over uh, the Western Hemisphere. 
uh, Chikungunya entered into St. Martin, uh, the island of St. Martin, the end of 2013. Now Chikungunya is all over the Western Hemisphere. And of course, let's not forget Zika virus infection, which is uh, now all over Latin America, the Caribbean, and now entered into uh, Florida and Texas. Uh, what fewer people are aware of is the same things happening on the other side of the Atlantic. So something really weird is going on in uh, southern Europe. Malaria has come back to Greece after it's been gone for 70 years. We have dengue in Portugal, chikungunya, West Nile virus now in Italy, uh, Spain, and southern France. We have schistosomiasis on the island of Corsica. So what's going on? I wrote a, a paper in one of my article in one of my favorite medical journals, Vice, that uh, compared this <laughs> compared this to the early scenes of the goat. Remember the 1980s Ghostbusters movie? Anyone remember, remember those scenes where you saw the green blob on the dining room table in the hotel, and then you saw the skeleton in the taxi cab, and you knew something bad was about to happen, but you couldn't quite connect the dots and figure it out? I think that's what's happening here. So let's stop for a minute and ask you, what the hell's going on? What, as Donald Trump will say, what the hell is going on with these vector-borne diseases? Why this explosion in the Western Hemisphere and this, uh, this rise in, in Southern Europe? Climate change. Climate change. So when you talk to the climate change people, uh, they will tell you that next to the Arctic, Southern Europe and the Southern United States and uh, uh, Central America are the next big shoes that are going to fall. So is it climate change? But what else is going on? Mike, what is it? Migration. Migration. Uh, in the case here, migration from the conflict zones, right? Coming from <clears throat> uh, North Africa uh, and the Middle East. But what else is going on? Farming, deforestation. Deforestation, farming. <clears throat> Absolutely. What else? I'm going to take a sip of water. What else is going on? Maybe less use of pesticides. What's happening to the economies of these countries? What's happening to the economy of Greece? People are going like this, yeah. Or, or across southern Europe, what's happening to the economy? It's tanking, right? All right, so the question is, what is it? Is it the climate change? Is it the, is it the human migrations? Is it urbanization? Is it deforestation? Is it, is it economic downturns and poverty? And the answer is, we have no idea. We have absolutely no idea. And we don't even know how to approach the problem. Because why? These are complex problems. And ordinarily, you would rely on a university to help solve this problem. But one of the problems that we have is universities tend to be very siloed. So if you're a virologist at Medical College of Wisconsin, and you're a young assistant professor, and you want to get promoted, what do you have to do? You have to write grants. And why do you have to write grants? So you can write your papers. And why do you write your papers? So you can get grants. And why do you write those grants? So you get more papers, right? And now the virologist is going to go to his department chair, who is, is a wonderful man, or is going to go to me as a dean and say, uh, I am now going to take a step back and uh, spend a year with the climate change the earth scientist or an economist or a political scientist. And they're like, what the, you know, you can't do that. That'll, you'll ruin your career. So we're very siloed, right? We don't have a mechanism that allows this uncomfortable dialogue between uh, different disciplines. So as a result, we've got complex problems like this that we don't have multidimensional solutions for. So what's going on in the world? Well, one of the ways that I like to frame it is, is this. How many people have heard of it? It tends to be, it's, it's sort of a, a, a trendy word that's being thrown on college campuses now. It's called the Anthropocene. The idea being that if you look at the big geological epics, right, the Pliocene, the Pleistocene, then you have the Holocene that started at the end of the Ice Age, that the idea is humans have so profoundly altered the environment that we've now bought ourselves our own geological uh, epic, uh, which is defined as a proposed epic that begins when human activity started to have a significant global impact on Earth's geology uh, and ecosystems. And, and so this is how, what I've identified as the really 
And this is what we've been all talking about just now, the really potent Anthropocene forces that are promoting the rise of these vector-borne and zoonotic diseases, deforestation, urbanization, human migrations, climate change, conflict and political destabilization, and then there's still poverty. Poverty, I still think, is very dominant. So it's a social determinant that I think is the, still the overriding factor. So I think what I'd like to do is switch gears now and talk about how some of these forces are promoting this rise in vector-borne and uh, zoonotic diseases. I'm going to focus on poverty first. And this is the topic of my second forgotten book uh, that, that just came out at the end of last year. Uh, it's called Blue Marble Health. And it, it's an interesting idea. What I did was I uh, looked at, uh, analyzed WA data coming from the World Health Organization, WHO, and analyzed data coming from the Global Burden of Disease Study, and found something that has changed over the last couple of years that was counterintuitive. And it says the following. It says that most of the world's poverty-related neglected diseases and neglected tropical diseases on a numbers basis are not necessarily in the poorest, most devastated countries of Africa. Yes, they're there too, but actually most of the world's neglected diseases, including half the world's helminth infections, visceral leishmaniasis, tuberculosis, dengue, Chagas disease, leprosy, and the list goes on, are actually in the 20 wealthiest economies together with Nigeria, which is actually a bigger economy than the bottom three or four. So how could that be? So that's counterintuitive, right? It's paradoxical. How could most of the world poverty-related diseases be in the 20 wealthiest economies, the group of 20 countries, the G20 countries? Well, the answer is it seems to be the poor living among the wealthy that now account for most of the world's uh, neglected uh, diseases. So what I'm showing you here is the new global health map. Not your father's global health, not your mother's global health. The new, the new, and maybe part of that is because of progress in the Millennium Development Goals. I'm showing you the pockets of poverty and poverty-related diseases in the G20 countries that now account for most of the world's uh, neglected diseases. So let's, let's do a little bit of a deeper dive in this. So let's look at uh, Chagas disease. So Chagas disease, is caused by Trypanosoma cruzi. It's a parasitic protozoan transmitted by kissing bugs, a major cause of heart disease. It turns out that most of the cases of Chagas disease are in Latin America's three largest economies. They're in Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico. And 99% of those people living in those three countries with Chagas disease are denied access to diagnosis and treatment. So the point being, it's not a resource issue. The resources are there but it's an advocacy issue, it's an awareness issue. It's neglect by the leaders of the three largest co uh, countries uh, in Latin America. Uh, let's give another example. Uh, let's look at northeastern Brazil. So Brazil, the largest economy in Latin America. Uh, has anyone been to northeastern Brazil, to Recife, Salvador de Bahia? Anybody been there? So this is, this is the center also of Brazil's poverty, in northeastern Brazil, it's where which is where you find highly endemic schistosomiasis, leishmaniasis, Chagas disease, and dengue. Even though Brazil's a wealthy economy, there's, this is the pocket of poverty. And what do we have in northeastern Brazil? Somebody said it. Zika, right? So uh, this is where Zika arose, right? This is where all the cases of microcephaly started coming out in northeastern Brazil in those same uh, cities. It's the same place where Brazil's other neglected tropical diseases were. Um, now, what is it about poverty? Why? What's the relationship between poverty and something like Zika? Why would poverty be an important determinant? Well, let's go look. Let's go look at what those cities look like. So here's Salvador de Bahia. Here's Recife. Let's see what we can see. First of all, Zika is transmitted by what? Mosquito. What species? Aedes aegypti. So what is, how does Aedes aegypti bite? Aedes aegypti um, is not like uh, other mosquitoes. It's closely adapted to human habitats. It bites an individual, then bite the next person over, the next person over. So crowding is a, is a key factor in the transmission of any virus transmitted by Aedes aegypti, a very highly urbanized mosquito. So what, do we have any crowding over here? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, all right, what do you see here? This is Hasefe. 
What do you see here that screams Zika at you? Water. Water, what else? No windows, right? No air conditioning, right? So substandard low-income housing, right? So these are all the factors that I think is, are major factors in the transmission of Zika as, as well as dengue and chikungunya and another uh, vector-borne uh, diseases. So what's happening now? What's happening is, is Zika is marching northward and it's in Venezuela. What's happening in Venezuela right now? The economy has collapsed, right? It used to be collapsing, now it's collapsed. So under Chavez and Maduro, and, um, and so what we're seeing now is a, we have a paper coming out in PLUS on the resurgence of neglected diseases in, in Venezuela. So we've seen the return of malaria and dengue, Chagas diseases off the charts, and schistosomiasis and Zika. So let's move up. Let's move into the southern United States. So early in 2016, the message coming from Washington and Atlanta from the CDC was... Don't worry about the United States. Everybody's wealthy. Everybody has air conditioning. So uh, I was saying, well, I don't think they've been down here because let's let's go look at what let's go see what this looks like. So this is Texas where I live and work. This is what Texas looks like on the border. Uh, uh, these they're called the colonias. They're basically unincorporated shanty towns. Um, you, I mean, it looks like a poster child for the '80s Egypti mosquito here, right? Uh, and this is, this is the Fifth Ward, which is a poor, uh, historically African-American uh, neighborhood. This is actually one of the first neighborhoods that free slaves went to in, in Houston. In Houston. Uh, what do you see here? Substandard housing. What is 80s Egypt I like more than anything else? Next to a discarded TV set, a discarded tire, right? So uh, the point is uh, we've now found evidence not only of Zika, but transmission of a lot of neglected tropical diseases, this blue marble health concept, in the poor neighborhoods of uh, Houston. And this is a, a poverty map of, 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 of Texas. So I wrote this piece in the New York Times last year called Zika is Coming. And what the New York Times did, which was kind of ama that's amazing what they can do, they took Simon Hayes coordinates at Oxford University and assembled, I think, the best 80s Egypti map I've, I've ever seen of the United States. And here's where it is, across the Gulf Coast. The idea being it's these poor neighborhoods in South Texas, Houston, South Florida, where you would expect to see uh, Zika virus uh, transmission. And so now, what's been happening? We've been having Zika transmission across South Texas uh, all during the winter, so in, in Brownsville, We've had a cluster of cases now in McAllen and the Hidalgo County. What's the winter been like down in Texas? Yeah, it's been the warmest winter on record. So that's not a good sign, right, when you're worried about uh, Zika potentially, uh, potentially coming. So we'll wait and see uh, what happens now. The other big, uh, other big uh, driver next to poverty has been conflict and the consequences after conflict. So uh, what we saw in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone back in 2014 are the consequences of decades of atrocities, which completely collapsed the health systems of, of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. And was, as those human populations were scavenging and trying to survive, they deforested a lot of areas, came into contact with bats. And this is what helped lead to the the widespread explosion of uh, Ebola virus infection in West Africa. So we know conflict's a big driver. And knowing that, where might you be concerned the next big shoe might fall? Yeah, it won't be Ebola, but look what's happening. So, and we're only getting glimpses of what's happening because we can't actually get into the ISIS-occupied areas of Syria, Iraq, uh, Libya, uh, getting into uh, uh, Yemen as well, but we get glimpses of it from the refugees spilling across the borders into Lebanon, into Turkey, uh, into Egypt, uh, and elsewhere. And look what we're seeing. We're seeing uh, the return of measles and polio. 
Uh, lots of vector-borne diseases. Leishmaniasis is taking off in a huge way. Hundreds of thousands of cases of uh, cutaneous uh, leishmaniasis that the locals call Aleppo evil because it produces permanent scarring on little kids. And then, especially for girls and women, it's a lifelong uh, uh, social stigma attached to it. Uh, animals are being trafficked all over the place. There's no more international borders, so we're seeing uh, lots of uh, zoonotic uh, diseases as well. All right, so what are we doing about this? Well, uh, I just said that the solutions have to be multidimensional, uh, and the biomedical model is, alone is not going to be sufficient. But one of the things we're trying to do is see if we can develop some of the, the vaccines for some of these new rise of vector-borne diseases that the big pharmaceutical companies are not interested in making. Why aren't there pharmaceutical companies interested in vaccines for these diseases? No money, right? So you have the brilliant quote from David Letterman who said, Pepsi has a new Doritos-flavored Mountain Dew. No, we don't have an Ebola vaccine, but we do have the Doritos-flavored Mountain Dew. So what he's saying is that it turns out that the technology to make the Ebola vaccine was actually first published in 2003. And it was published by Gary Nabel's group at the NIH. And it sat there for a decade because nobody cared about making it into a, making the discovery into a bottle of vaccine. It was only when things got really dire uh, in 2014 that the Obama administration put up $100 million to BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research Development Authority, and then turned it into a bottle of vaccine and started clinical testing. And what happened by the time clinical testing was underway? If you remember. Ebola disappeared. Ebola disappeared and 11,000 people perished. So it said the failure in the system was not the science, it was all the financial innovation and the financial instruments that we have to get vaccines developed. So there's been a, in response to this at the World Economic Forum in Davos, there was an effort to create a $2 billion fund, like a global fund for vaccine development called CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. And these are, and they only raised half a, half a billion, $500 million. And this is with the Gates Foundation, Wellcome Trust, uh, the Norwegian government, and, and a couple of others. And these are the three targets they've advertised that they're going to focus on. Nipa, Lhasa, and MERS coronavirus. What do people think of that? Good choice? I have mixed feelings. I recognize their threats. But how many people are affected by Nipah, Lhasa, and MERS coronavirus? You can round off if you want. <laughs> Rounds off to about zero, right? So, so they kind of focus more on imaginary threats than real threats, in my opinion. Or as I sometimes say in my frustration, the imaginary illnesses that scare white people rather than the real diseases uh, affecting people living in poverty. So what we're doing at Texas Children's Hospital in Baylor is to create what my kids call Dad's Guaranteed Money Losing Company, which is uh, based in the Feigen Center of Texas Children's Hospital, where we're now taking on, and it looks like a mid-sized biotech company, we're taking on making uh, these uh, vaccines. And uh, let me just go through a few of the scientific hurdles that we face. Um, this, is, this is our kind of our um, holy grail which is to do what Reno Rapioli did. Reno Rapioli is a very um, accomplished scientist. He used to work for Novartis. Now he works for GlaxoSmithKline. And he's pioneered this concept of reverse vaccinology, where what he could do is look at um, a, a genome like Neisseria meningitidis serogroup B. And he's only done this for bacterial infections. So for meningococcus B, and then do in silico predictions of vaccine candidates, he identifies 600 potential vaccine candidates. He does high throughput expression in E. coli. And in this case, he got 350 proteins successfully expressed. He purifies the protein, immunizes mice, shows that the mouse serum will then identify the ones that are on the surface, identifies 91 surface exposed proteins, shows that 28 of that bactericidal activity, and then he could do his final down selection. And he licensed the first reverse vaccinology vaccine for, for Bexero, called Bexero, B-E-X-S-E-R-O. And so amazing accomplishment. The problem is, what are we working on? We're working on hookworm and schistosomiasis, uh, leash mania, Chagas disease. Those are eukaryotic pathogens. So what's the problem? Well, um, 
we still have it as our holy grail because what are the problems that we face? Well, one, the genomes are big, right? The schistosome genomes is every, big as, every bit as big as the human genome. Uh, when we express them in E. coli, we get golf balls at the bottom of the, uh, bottom of the flask because they express as inclusion bodies. So it's low throughput, not high throughput, and the animal models are awful. Uh, but having said that, we've made some progress. We have now a, um, we've made vaccines now for hookworm and schistosomiasis in clinical trials. Let me just briefly tell you about the schistosomiasis vaccine. The lead candidate is this surface protein called tetraspanin 2 that gives high levels of expression uh, in, uh, in, in pickia and uh, yeast, uh, methanol utilizing yeast, and we're getting good egg reduction, end organ pathology, and inflammation in laboratory animals. And it was discovered in collaboration with Alex Lucas's group. Alex used to be with us, and now he's on his own at James Cook University. And he did this high, this very interesting array system doing what he calls immunomics, looking at sera from putatively resistant patients and looking at all the surface proteins of the schistosome. And we've been able to identify one surface protein called TSP2 uh, that is now uh, in just finished phase one trials in collaboration uh, with the NIH. Uh, and this is what it looks like on the surface. One of the nice things you can do about schistosomes, you could do RNAi for schistosomes. It's harder for, for hookworms. We haven't been able to do that yet. And so we can wipe out the biogenesis of the surface tegument by doing RNAi. Uh, now, this was a real problem. This was one that was not well funded. Uh, we had basically raised about a million dollars in private support and what, what do you do with that? And what we worked with with the NIH was NIH, even though they'll tell you to apply for grants, they also have a contracting system. They contract out with, with, toxic, with GLP toxicology people. With, uh, they'll contract out with um, vaccine trial evaluation units. And we got the NIH to buy into the idea that they would do the clinical testing. And they did it at the Baylor College of Medicine a Vaccine Trial Evaluation Unit, and we just finished, so we'll, we'll find out what the results of the phase one trials are. Our hookworm vaccines look like they're highly immunogenic, and they're moving forward, as is our schistosomiasis. But, but two problems that I want to tell you about. One is financing. We still haven't figured out the financing model for how we're going to do the advanced industrial and clinical development. The other problem that is that we're, an, we're a hybrid of an academic institution and a biotech. So all of our lead scientists are assistant or associate professors, and they need papers. So how do you get papers? Because a lot of the stuff we do is not hypothesis-driven research. We're actually scaling up and making it. So the reason I'm showing you the title of this paper is not because it's the most interesting paper in the world. I'm showing you precisely because it is the least interesting paper uh, in the world. So let's read the title. Expression at a 20 liter scale of purification of the extracellular domain of the schistosome of and ITSP2 recombinant protein. The point is, every step of our industrial process, we publish somewhere uh, in order to uh, get, get this going. So we publish a lot in, in journals like Protein Expression and Purification. Um, human Vaccines and Immunology has been pretty good at taking our stuff. So all of our scientists are not only getting paid to be research scientists, they're also writing papers as, as well. Um, we're now also looking at the problem of vaccines for emerging diseases in, in Texas. This is a new paper they have coming out in PLUS which estimates the number of people with a neglected tropical disease in the state of Texas. And Chagas disease is one of the big ones where we're actually seeing widespread transmission of the disease in the state of Texas. Now, the problem with Chagas disease is um, the, a big trial known as the BENEFIT trial. And BENEFIT is an acronym that includes the word benzonidazole. The lead drug recently showed that the medicine has absolutely no effect on people once heart disease has started. So what we've uh, designed is a therapeutic vaccine that could be given alongside it to rescue the impact of benzonidazole. And it includes a recombinant protein antigen that we've solved the crystal structure for, known as TC24. And the other problem that we face in making vaccines that are not money winners is trying to find partners that will give us the right adjuvants that we need. And that's always a struggle because the big pharmaceutical companies fiercely hang on to their uh, intellectual property for their adjuvants. But we've been able to work with a, J a Japanese company called ASI, and they've uh, given us uh, 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 the rights to this TLR4 agonist known as E6020, and it's doing what we need to do. Now, the problem with Chagas vaccines 
is, well, multiple fold, but one of them is, you know, for worm vaccines, we need high levels of antibody. We find for these Chagas disease vaccines, we need high levels of Th1 responses. And the proof of concept for a lot of the vaccine candidates for Chagas disease was done through DNA vaccines in mice. Now, what happens if you take a DNA vaccine in mice and put it into a person? You don't get that same level of, of protection. So we can't use DNA vaccines. We're trying to do it with recombinant protein vaccines. But then the problem we face is how do you get strong Th1 responses for an intracellular parasite like T. t cruzi with a, recombinant protein antigen, a, a, with a recombinant protein antigen? Can we adjuvant our way through the problem? And we're not sure we can do this, but we think we're getting some good results now with E6020. Um, this is our preliminary results. Reduction in parasitemia, increased survival during the acute phase. Uh, we're getting antigen-specific gamma interferon, uh, which we're not sure where it's coming from, because sometimes it's coming from CD8-positive cells, but oftentimes we're not eliciting a big CD8-positive re responses, and we're not seeing it from the CD4 cells. So we're wondering if we're stimulating a lot of natural killer cell activity. We're trying to pin that down. The other problem we face is when we started scaling a production of this, and this is something you wouldn't worry about in an academic lab, but you have to worry about it in our guaranteed money losing company, is we're getting aggregation through intermolecular disulfide bonds. So what this meant was the, our scientists had to re-engineer the molecule to take out all the cysteines and change them to serines, and then so we wouldn't get the intermolecular disulfide bonds, which means we had to start all over again in showing immunogenicity and protection, because the FDA uh, wants that kind. And then we had to show evidence that um, through our biophysical profiling, we do a lot of biophysical profiling, showing by fluorescence and circular dichroism, we didn't change the structure of the molecule. And this is what we're showing, that we can basically block, the, the blue here is fibrosis. So the reason you die of Chagas disease is you get fibrosis in your conduction system. And this causes a, a fatal arrhythmia or a, a dysarrhythmia. In the case of our vaccine, we can show we can block the development of fibrosis. And this is showing that um, by uh, echocardiography, we can do mouse echocardiographs, echocardiography. I mean, the Texas Medical Center is quite unique in that it was started on the basis of heart surgery and cardiology, DeBakey and Cooley, so that anywhere you throw a stone in the Texas Medical Center, you'll hit a cardiologist or a cardiothoracic surgeon, which is great because they have all sorts of sophisticated imaging uh, for looking at this, and we can build on this and show by echocardiography that we're, making, that we're solving the mouse uh, Chagas disease problem. So, and now we're uh, working now with the Carlos Slim Foundation. Anybody know who Carlos Slim is? Does that name mean anything to you? The second richest man in the world, right, next to Bill Gates. So he's the, uh, based in Mexico. And so now we're working with him. And this is how I'll end. This is the last slide to say we're also trying to make an effort now to do uh, a lot of capacity building because that we need more organizations like what we have at Texas Children's Hospital across the world. And uh, Dr. Crone mentioned my role as U.S. Science Envoy, and what I did in that role was see if we can teach others how to do what we do in Houston. And I've had this role now for the last two years uh, in terms of serving uh, through with the State Department and the White House to see if we can build.